The United States conducted airstrikes in Iraq against Iran-linked militants in response to a series of attacks on U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria by Iran-backed groups. This marks the fourth round of American retaliatory airstrikes since mid-October, with over 60 attacks reported. The recent strikes targeted a command and control node and an operations center used by Qataib Hezbollah. The retaliation was prompted by militants launching close-range ballistic missiles at U.S. forces, causing injuries. The U.S. emphasizes self-defense but holds Iran accountable, warning of further measures if necessary. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa accused Israel of war crimes and acts tantamount to genocide during a virtual meeting of leaders from developing countries, including Russia's Vladimir Putin and China's Xi Jinping. Ramaphosa condemned both Israel and Hamas, stating that the collective punishment of Palestinian civilians by Israel is a war crime, and the denial of essential resources to Gaza residents is akin to genocide. Putin and Xi called for a ceasefire and the release of hostages but were more cautious in their criticism. Putin suggested that the BRICS bloc, which includes Russia and China, could play a key role in finding a political settlement. The meeting followed China's hosting of foreign ministers from countries including Saudi Arabia and Indonesia. Emphasizing China's support for the Palestinians. Ramaphosa also called for the International Criminal Court to prosecute those responsible for war crimes, and later, South African lawmakers voted to shut down the Israeli embassy and cut diplomatic ties until a Gaza ceasefire is agreed upon. The recently declassified intelligence indicates that the Russian mercenary organization Wagner Group was preparing to provide an air defense capability, potentially a Panzer missile system, to either Hezbollah or Iran. The direction for this action came from the Russian government. The intelligence did not specify the source of the missile system, but there were previous reports that Wagner was tasked with delivering a surface-to-air SA-22 missile system from Syria to Hezbollah in Lebanon. The U.S. expressed concerns about the ongoing arms relationship between Russia and Iran and the potential for Iran to provide ballistic missiles to Russia. The possibility of Hezbollah acquiring a new air defense system raises concerns amid tensions in the region, especially regarding the northern border with Israel. Despite Hezbollah and Israel engaging in cross-border strikes, U.S. officials believe Hezbollah is not currently planning a significant entry into the conflict. Israeli strikes in southern Lebanon on Tuesday resulted in eight deaths, including two journalists from the Lebanese TV channel al Mayadeen and a senior Hamas official. The strike near Tir Harfa targeted the journalists, leading to accusations of intentional targeting by Israel due to the channel's pro-Palestinian and pro-Iranian stance. Lebanon's caretaker prime minister condemned the attack as an attempt to silence the media, while Israel cited the area's active hostilities and the dangers of being present in the region. Another Israeli strike on a car near Tyre killed four people, including a senior Hamas member. The recent violence along the Israel-Lebanon border, sparked by Hamas' October 7 attack, has claimed over 80 lives, including Hezbollah fighters and Lebanese civilians. The situation raises concerns about the potential escalation of conflict in the region. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu requested the Israeli government's support for a deal aiming to secure the release of hostages taken by Palestinian Hamas militants during the October 7 assault on Israel. The deal, facilitated with U.S. President Joe Biden's intervention, is expected to involve a four- or five-day ceasefire and includes 50 hostages, mainly women and children, in exchange for 150 Palestinian prisoners. The hostages were taken during Hamas' incursion into Israel, and the proposed deal follows weeks of Israeli bombardment of Gaza. The situation has resulted in casualties on both sides and ongoing tensions in the region. Russian President Vladimir Putin has called for a political solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and suggested that regional states and members of the BRICS group could play a key role in achieving such a settlement. Speaking during a virtual BRICS summit, Putin blamed the Middle East crisis on the failure of U.S. diplomacy in the region. While not providing details on how such efforts might be organized, Putin expressed the need for joint international efforts to de-escalate the situation, achieve a ceasefire, and find a political resolution to the conflict. The BRICS group, which includes Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, agreed in August to expand its membership to include Saudi Arabia. Iran, Ethiopia, Egypt, Argentina, and the United Arab Emirates. Experts suggest that Putin is using the Gaza crisis to strengthen geopolitical alliances and counter U.S. dominance, emphasizing his repeated criticisms of U.S. policy and expressions of sympathy for the Palestinian cause. 
Russia welcomed the ceasefire agreement in the Israel-Palestinian conflict, stating that humanitarian pauses are crucial for progress towards a settlement. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov expressed relief at the news and highlighted that such pauses are essential for building the foundation of future attempts at a sustainable resolution. Russia, with long-standing ties to Israel, Hamas, and other regional players, has consistently called for truces and humanitarian pauses. President Vladimir Putin has emphasized the suffering of Palestinian citizens, criticized U.S. policy, and urged Israel to exercise restraint throughout the conflict. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi urged leaders of the G20 nations to take necessary steps to prevent the Israel-Hamas conflict from escalating into a wider regional conflict. Speaking at the opening of the virtual G20 summit, Modi expressed concern about the insecurity and instability in the West Asian region. He highlighted the need to ensure that the Israel-Hamas conflict does not transform into a broader regional crisis. Modi emphasized the unacceptability of terrorism and condemned civilian deaths, calling for timely and uninterrupted humanitarian aid. India, with strategic ties to Israel and long-standing relations with Arab countries, seeks to balance its position on the conflict. The G20 summit, attended by leaders such as Vladimir Putin, Li Chang, Fumio Kishida, Tayyip Erdogan, Justin Trudeau, Anthony Albanese, and Luiz Inacio Lula da Silva, aimed to review progress on policy goals and objectives announced in the September summit. A group of senior officials from Muslim countries, formed earlier this month at a summit of the Arab League and Organization of Islamic Cooperation OIC, is visiting the UN Security Council's five permanent members and other nations to advocate for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The group includes representatives from Turkey, Qatar, Egypt, Jordan, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, the Palestinian Authority, and the OIC Secretary General. Their primary goal is to secure a ceasefire, facilitate humanitarian aid to Gaza, and work towards a two-state solution for Palestinians. Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh suggested progress toward a truce with Israel despite ongoing conflict. The group will meet with British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and French President Emmanuel Macron during visits to Britain and France. Evacuees from Gaza, including medical patients, have been arriving in Turkey after being evacuated to Egypt. The group's Turkish foreign minister, Hakan Fidan, is expected to join the tour in the future legs after President Erdogan's visit to Algeria. The Hungarian government's campaign targeting Ursula von der Leyen and Alexander Soros is criticized by a spokesperson for the Open Society Foundations, calling it propaganda deeply tainted by anti-Semitism. The campaign features billboards for the 2024 European parliamentary elections, portraying von der Leyen and Soros with the text, Let's not dance to their tunes. The spokesperson accuses the Hungarian government of using taxpayer money for anti-Semitic political propaganda, while the government denies such allegations, emphasizing that it targets Soros based on his ideology and activism, not his identity as a Jew. Prime Minister Viktor Orban has previously portrayed Soros as a figure plotting against Hungary and supporting mass immigration. A significant portion of the US public, particularly Republicans, believes the country is spending too much on aid to Ukraine, influencing the resistance among conservative GOP lawmakers to approve more aid for Kyiv. The latest poll shows that 45% think the US government is spending too much on Ukraine, down from 52% in October. Republican opposition remains strong, with 59% expressing concerns about excessive spending on Ukraine. The Biden administration is urging lawmakers to pass a $106 billion emergency spending package, but Congress has resisted these efforts in recent months. The survey also indicates that half of U.S. adults are extremely or very concerned about Russia's influence as a direct threat to the United States. Democrats are more likely than Republicans to see Ukraine as a nation of shared values and to support more aid for Ukraine. Ukraine's Prime Minister Denis Shmihal expressed gratitude for a new 1.5 billion euro aid tranche from the European Union EU, emphasizing its significance in maintaining the country's macroeconomic stability during the ongoing war with Russia. Shmihal hopes for swift approval of the EU's multi-year 50 billion euro program for Ukraine amid uncertainties about aid from the United States for the coming year. The EU's latest tranche brings its total aid to Ukraine to 16.5 billion euros this year. The war has severely impacted Ukraine's economy, prompting reliance on Western allies for financial support. The finance ministry expects another aid tranche from the EU in December, and the EU has been the largest financial donor to Ukraine in 2023. 
Ukraine faces a budget gap of about $43 billion next year and plans to cover it with foreign financial assistance, seeking around 18 billion euros from the EU's Ukraine facility program and 12 to $14 billion in economic support from the United States. French President Emmanuel Macron expressed deep concern to Chinese leader Xi Jinping about military cooperation between Russia and North Korea during a phone conversation. Macron urged China to recognize the problematic nature of this development and its potential to fuel Russian aggression against Ukraine. Russia has sought to strengthen ties with North Korea amid its pariah status in the West due to the conflict in Ukraine. The White House previously stated that North Korea delivered over 1,000 containers of military equipment to Russia for use in Ukraine. China, while deepening ties with Moscow, has refrained from condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Macron called on China to make a significant contribution to UN humanitarian aid for Palestinian civilians. Chinese leader Xi Jinping met with Vyacheslav Volodin, the speaker of the Russian Duma, emphasizing the strengthening of ties between China and Russia. She expressed a willingness to enhance cooperation and jointly promote the development of the Belt and Road Initiative. Russia reiterated its support for China's one-China policy and territorial integrity. China has been a key supporter of Russia since the invasion of Ukraine, providing diplomatic and economic support, mitigating the impact of Western sanctions. Both nations have reinforced military bonds, and China has increased exports to Russia as trade ties with the West have been severed due to the conflict. The White House expressed concern that Iran may provide Russia with ballistic missiles for use in the war against Ukraine. A U.S. national security official highlighted Iran's support for Russia, including drones, guided aerial bombs, and artillery ammunition. Concerns were raised about Iran potentially providing ballistic missiles after a meeting in September where Iran showcased ballistic missile systems to Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. The U.S. warned of the possibility and noted Russia's offers of defense cooperation to Iran. The growing military partnership between Iran and Russia is viewed as harmful to Ukraine and the international community. The U.S. has taken steps to thwart potential missile-related transfers involving Iran and issued guidance to private companies to avoid inadvertently supporting Iran's development efforts. The United States and the Philippines are conducting joint air and maritime patrols in the South China Sea in response to growingly aggressive Chinese activity in the region. The patrols, involving both the U.S. and Philippine navies, took place near Batons, the northernmost province of the Philippines, close to Taiwan. China, which claims virtually the entire South China Sea, warned that the joint patrols must not undermine its territorial sovereignty in maritime rights. The move comes after Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. described the situation in the South China Sea as increasingly dire. The joint patrols aim to bolster military interoperability and enhance regional security. Former Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte has stated that he would return to politics and run for senator or vice president if his daughter, Vice President Sara Duterte, were to be impeached. The vice president is facing scrutiny over her request for and use of confidential funds. Duterte, who ended his six-year term in June 2022, warned political opponents that the midterm elections are approaching. The Philippines is set to vote for local leaders, members of the House and the Senate in May 2025, and the next president and vice president in 2028. Duterte has backed Vice President Sara Duterte, emphasizing their excellent relationship. Taiwan reported Chinese military activity as 11 aircraft, including J-10 and J-16 fighters, H-6 bombers, and early warning aircraft, crossed the sensitive median line of the Taiwan Strait. The incident occurred as Taiwan's election campaign intensified ahead of the presidential and parliamentary polls scheduled for January 13. The ruling Democratic Progressive Party, DPP, registered its presidential ticket, while the opposition, particularly the Kuomintang Party, is facing internal disagreements over a potential joint bid. China considers Taiwan a part of its territory and has increased military patrols and drills near the island, seeking to pressure Taipei over sovereignty claims. As Taiwan's presidential election approaches, Vice President Lai ching te the frontrunner from the ruling Democratic Progressive Party, DPP, emphasized the importance of experienced leadership amid opposition disputes. Lai, seen as a separatist by China, registered his candidacy with former U.S. envoy Xiao Bai Kim. Talks for a joint presidential challenge between the opposition Kuomintang, KMT, and Taiwan People's Party, TPP, have stalled over the interpretation of opinion polls. The KMT's Ho Uih seeks a reconsideration, 
while the TPP rejects the KMT's approach. The registration deadline is Friday, with other candidates like Terry Go yet to formally register. North Korea claimed to have successfully launched its first spy satellite, named Malajiang-1, into orbit. If functional, the satellite could enhance North Korea's military capabilities, improving targeting accuracy and intelligence gathering. While South Korea, the United States, and Japan couldn't independently confirm the satellite's orbit, South Korea deemed the launch a clear violation of a UN Security Council resolution. The rocket's trajectory, passing over Japan's Okinawa prefecture, triggered condemnation from Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. The move has increased tensions in the region, with North Korea vowing more launches for self-defense. South Korea has moved to suspend part of the 2018 Comprehensive Military Agreement with North Korea after the latter claimed to have successfully launched its first spy satellite. South Korean Prime Minister Han duk su announced the move, involving the restoration of reconnaissance and surveillance operations around the military demarcation line, during a cabinet meeting. The pact was aimed at de-escalating tensions on the Korean peninsula and has faced scrutiny, with critics suggesting it limits South Korea's ability to monitor North Korea's actions around the border. The satellite launch raised concerns, with the US calling it a brazen violation of UN Security Council resolutions. The conflict between Myanmar's military and ethnic groups seeking autonomy has escalated to become the largest in scale and most extensive geographically since the 2021 coup, according to the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. More than 286,000 people have been displaced since an alliance of ethnic armies launched an offensive in northern Shan state in late October. The clashes, which have spread to other regions, pose a heightened risk to civilian populations across the country. The situation illustrates the challenges Myanmar's ruling junta faces in controlling the country nearly three years after the coup.